the state government to accelerate change. And I'm a private sector person by background, so one of the things that I look at is what's already going on in markets and how can you accelerate things that are already happening. And so I want to start with talking about, I'm going to talk about two things so you know where I'm going. I want to talk about the utility industry and I want to link what's going on with the utility industry to what we're thinking about in terms of the Green Bank. So I'll start with the utility industry and change is coming to the utility industry. Uh, and it was a very effective uh, model, has been a very effective model that has kept rates low and provided reliability in the past. And to, attra to attract the capital, because after all it's a capital intensive industry, much of the industry, certainly the bulk of transmission and distribution, has been regulated, because that's how you get a stable rate of return, is uh, you regulate it. So the business models, therefore, when you have a regulated business, tends to compensate those utilities to invest in plant, because you get a rate of return on your investment in plant, and to produce electricity from central station generation. That's what the model has done. Now, New York, as other states, we've been changing uh, our regulatory regime, but it hasn't really necessarily accomplished everything that we wanted to, to change. So we've, we've uh, deregulated generation. Many states in the country and places around the world have deregulated generation. So generation is a competitive market. But the problem with that is it still feeds into a transmission and distribution system that's regulated. So we haven't really gotten away from this central station generation. Second thing we've done is we have a kind of decoupling, which other states have, have adopted, which means that utilities, transmission and distribution utilities, are indifferent to, um, they're not paid on the basis of the amount of electrons that are sold to customers. They have no volumetric incentive. So in theory, that says, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, we don't want to have utilities that are incented for, for a quantum of elect electricity. Uh, but the way that that works in, in practice is that uh, there's a true-up mechanism. So if uh, customers decide that they want to invest in energy efficiency, that's fantastic for those customers, but it means that the rates go up for everybody else because the utilities have a true-up mechanism, so they have the same amount of revenues. So, um, so that that's so you have that issue. Um, so then we have. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to read my right here. Uh, then, because there's the pressure to keep rates low, regulators are concerned about keeping rates low for consumers, there's always the tension between investments that might have long-term payoffs, such as the smarter grid, but, but, but may cost more, and near-term low-cost solutions. So we're, we've got some elements of the system that are working and some elements of the system that are not working, and at the same time what we're trying to do is we are imposing more and more obligations on the utility system. We want the utility system to be more resilient. We want the utility system, we have to, in New York, in New York City, for example, we have to uh, invest more in the system to accommodate more uh, peak demand during summer. So all this costs more. And then in addition to that, we have renewable portfolio standards, which is added to the bill in terms of system benefit charges. So electric rates continue to go up, and so that encourages more and more customers to do energy efficiency or distributed generation solutions, but with the true up mechanism I already talked about, means that rates go up for everybody else, which leads to more switching away from utilities. So this creates a number of problems, it creates problems for the utility industry, but it also creates real equity problems since those that can figure out alternatives will do so, and those that don't will wind up paying much more for their electricity. And this is really the wireline problem in telephony. Uh, those people that still have wireline phones get less and less quality service and they're paying more and more. And that's where we could be heading in the electric utility industry.
the root of this issue is really what undergirds the utility business model. Because the, what set up the utility business model, the basic assumption underlying the utility, the utility business model is that the collective is cheaper than the individual. That's why we have a regulated business. But I think the question is, is we may be heading into a period where the individual is cheaper than the collective. And that's the pressure that face utilities. So I want to quickly go through a number of things which, um, which support the point that change is coming. So I want to talk about some innovation things and then some things that are going on in terms of the customers. So we already know about solar costs and solar costs declining. I was at the Department of Energy before I came to the state of New York, and Secretary Chu uh, set up the Sunshot program, and the idea was to have a dollar a watt by 2020 in terms of uh, uh, equipment costs, and um, we're already through that number, 80 cents. So the emphasis is now on soft costs, and here's the frontier of solar innovation, and it's everything from permitting, which can lower soft costs by almost 80 cents to different kinds of financing instruments. And so there's been discussions about trying to create capital markets instruments in the form of REITs or MLPs, which are not available to the renewable energy industry, to different kinds of aggregation, aggregation of smaller customers into larger projects and aggregating small projects into larger financing packages and aggregating small investors to smaller projects. Another kind of innovation has been solarizing and the involvement of uh, communities. So solarizing has reduced costs of solar by 25% in Connecticut. And even utilities, uh, traditional utilities in Colorado, XL opened its registration for new community solar installations uh, in its net metering program. And within 30 minutes, applications totaling 13 and a half megawatts were received and the, and the whole applications were shut down. So we know that that, that community uh, involvement can reduce costs. It's another kind of innovation. Similar kind of dynamic is occurring in battery costs. So electric vehicles have not achieved the high expectations of penetration that perhaps people thought, but when plotted against early adoption curves uh, of things like computers and mobile phones, it's ahead of the curve. And with scale, battery costs will continue to decline logarithmically. The CHP business, combined heat and power, in particular, the small CHP at the household level is attracting lots of attention because of low natural gas prices. So there are several venture capital firms backing devices to install at the residential level that will not be backup power, but act instead of the utility. So you can imagine if one of those things actually takes off, what it will mean. And the list goes on. MIT is working with an energy efficiency company on a satellite imagery technology that will use thermal imagery to target customers. Uh, satellite imagery has already helped some solar installers reduce customer acquisition costs by being able to avoid sending a representative to a house for a quotation. It can be done remotely. So there are also technologies for reading the signature of energy usage to determine whether a customer has an older appliance or whether air conditioning filters need to be changed. And that takes us, of course, to the to so-called big data. So as the cost of data processing have declined and more and more data generated and made available, there's the ability to make interpretations of data and to use data to identify potential customers and again, to reduce customer acquisition costs. You know, and the other thing about data, and this is a particular interest of mine, it's also using data to help create more customer segmentation, identifying dif different customer segments based upon customer preferences. And, and for all of you that have been so interested in energy efficiency, one of the problems in energy efficiency is we've tended to sell it too much on the basis of dollars and cents, and not enough on the basis of of other things that may motivate consumers more. Comfort. Uh, men seem to be more uncomfortable in the summer and women are more uncomfortable in the winter. And 
maybe it's a good time to sell energy efficiency when couples are going to have their first child because the kid's room is typically the loser room. And so that's a good time. Or there are, pe there are customers that just don't like utilities, and that's a motivator. Or they're already going to do something else in their house and, and to make the house more fun to live in, and that's the time to sell energy efficiency services. There's also the whole point about the uh, towel, towel, you know, hang your towel up in the hotel room, and it's not the sign that says hang up your towel because it'll save the planet, is not the effective sign. The effective sign is 75% of the people that stayed in this room hung up their towel because the tribe is more important as a motivator. So my point is, is that all this data work will help advance more work on customer segmentation. So I want to also talk about things from the customer side. So as I said before, um, electricity costs to the customer are going down. Generation costs may be going down, but the costs of transmission and distribution are going up. So your bill is not going down. Ratepayers must pay the cost of upgrading the transmission and distribution infrastructure. And as I said before, we impose the additional cost of energy efficiency and renewable energy on ratepayers under the current regime. So ultimately, we wind up we're building, two, building parts of two different systems, central station and distri distributed, and ratepayers are needing to pay for both. And so we have kind of an analog, literally and figuratively, have an analog and a digital system and we're not getting the cost advantage as a digital. And it's not just the cost of power, but also reliability and power quality. And when I talk about power quality, I'm also talking about DC, because most appliances, machinery, lighting are DC, and we're still producing AC. So it's not surprising that customers may want to reduce their reliance upon the grid and seek distributed sol solutions which, as I said before, wind up raising the cost for everybody else. So uh, we need to think about these trends. And when I say we, I'm talking about all of us. And we are engaged in these kind of conversations with the electric utility industry. Who worries about managing the customer's bill in the private sector now? Does the regulated utility? No. Does the independent power producers, do they worry about the customer bill? No. Does the solar installer? Perhaps for one customer they worry about it, but no one's worrying about customer bills in the aggregate. So the question, I think, is not if change is coming to the utility industry, it's when and how messy it will be. We need to look at Germany, and I know there are many people from Europe here, to see what can happen to a utility industry if we don't get ahead of some of the trends. Now, I love Germany and what Germany has done in terms of promoting the renewable energy industry. There probably wouldn't be a solar or wind industry without, at least certainly at the scale and cost, without what Germany has done. But Germany is also a cautionary tale. It's a cautionary tale because there's been a destruction in equity value for German utilities and for manufacturers of solar equipment. There have been operating issues. You have lignite plants that were never intended to go on and off, but they need to go on and off because of the proportion of renewable energy that's being generated during some days. And there's some pushback, obviously, in terms of higher power costs. So if we, and I use the word we here, again, if the industry and regulators don't figure this out, the risks are loss in asset value, stranded assets, higher power costs to consumers, foregone economic development, and loss of time. And since we're concerned about climate change, we're running out of time. So part of figuring out how to achieve the promise of the better utility is to figure out how much of the system needs to